Hey, so can I close the door at the back of the class, back of the room, please? Okay, so just I had a couple of questions during the break time. First one was, where did I, I, where did I get this number from? So just to explain the situation again, we saw that Korean 10-year bond. So can you turn on the light there, please? Korean 10-year bond was 1.8% yield. So we already explained yield in week one, right? And we, we practiced that, but we need to ex maybe explain again. It's a little bit complicated, okay? Some people don't understand what that means, and we need to understand what that means. Okay, so basically when we buy a bond, let's say the bond is for 10 trillion won, okay, it means that the country is going to pay me 10 trillion won after 10 years, okay, but the problem that complicates it is that the, they're also going to give me a coupon payment, okay, so they're going to give me a coupon, okay, let's say 1 billion won every year. So I have to decide how much is that worth to me today, okay? How much money am I going to pay for this product? The Korean government gives me a paper called a bond. A bond is just a piece of paper, okay? Saying I will pay you 10 trillion won after 10 years and I will pay you a coupon of 1 billion won every year, okay? Then I have to decide at the auction how much am I going to pay today for this bond? Okay? Then let's just say, for example, I pay 9.9 .9 trillion won for this bond. Okay? Then it means that I have to use our present value equations to calculate the yield. This is the present value. This is an annuity. Okay? And this is a future value. Okay, so one of your questions is like this, on your thing, one of the students asked me about this. Okay, you know the future value, you know the present value, find I. I is the yield. Okay, do you understand? For example, this one. We have present value equals future value over 1 plus I to the power of N. Okay, so in your question, you know the present value, you know the future value, you have to find I. I is the yield, okay? Yield is basically, some people call it the interest rate. Because normally this would be the interest, okay? But with bonds, we don't usually pay the same amount today as we get back. So we have to change the coupons somewhat, okay? And that's called the yield. Does everybody understand the yield? Okay? So the yield on the bond includes in the time value of money, we learned that we have three things. What three things make up the time value of money? When we're making our discount rate, what are the three things for the time value of money? Inflation, what else? Hmm? Risk, and what else? One more thing. Inflation risk and preference or the real interest rate. Okay? So, if I look at the Korean government bond, which the yield is 1.8%, what does it include? Does it include inflation? Yeah. Yes. Does it include risk? Yeah. Yeah. If it was the US, would it include risk? No. No, no but it's Korea, it includes risk. Does it include the real interest rate? Yes, okay? So we want to find the risk-free rate. Risk-free rate is going to be minus risk. So the risk-free rate only includes inflation and the preference, okay, for any currency. Do you understand the risk-free rate? Risk-free rate, take out the risk, no risk, okay? US government bond, we don't need to do anything. US government already has no risk. AAA rated country, no risk. Okay? The country has a different rating. We go to the table. We find out how many. This is 0.3. Okay? How much do we add on for this specific rating? 
So we find the rating and then we find the number. That tells us the risk. So in Korea's case, let's just say Korea is AA and it's a 10 year bond. This is for companies, not for. Problem is, this is for companies, not for countries, right? This table. But let's just say that it's. The risk, this is for companies, is 1.21% is risk, right? Then the risk free rate is going to be 1.6, right? Percent, sorry, 0.6%. Okay? If risk is 1.2% and the total of these three things is 1.8, okay? Then the risk free rate, just these two, is 0.6, okay? Do you understand? Risk for Korea, 1.2%. Okay? This plus this, 0 0.6. If we want to go further, we can find out what this is. Okay? And then we can subtract that, and then we know the inflation, expected inflation for Korea. <coughs> what that tells us, what does the market think the inflation will be in Korea in the future? Okay? Market's opinion of inflation. So if we have the US bond, or the German bond, Say that the US bond we bond we saw was also 1.7, right? <coughs> US. Then that is just there's no risk. So this 1.7 is just inflation plus preference. Okay, or the real interest rate. Now we can find the real interest rate we mentioned before for the United States <coughs> by looking at tips. TIPS is Treasury Inflation Index Security. Inflation Index Security means at the end of the year, the US government is going to pay you back inflation. Inflation was 1%, they give you back 1% at the end of the year. Do you understand? So you're protected against inflation in this bond. You, no inflation, no risk, only preference. This is the rate over the, since 2012. It went into negative territory in 2013. Okay? People actually preferred uh, that you know this real interest rate was actually negative. The reason was U.S. government bond is a safe haven. If there's a crisis, people tend to invest their money in the U.S. bonds. Okay, but it's gone back up again, and now that now today it's 0.18 percent. We can use this real interest rate for the U.S. or for other countries in the world too, because it's the same. Right? Investors are global investors, so the real interest rate should be the same all over the world. Inflation is going to be different based on the currency, risk is different based on the country, but real interest rate is the same. So if we look at Korea, then we, we want to find inflation, we can find this is 0.18, okay? So then inflation is, is 0.42%, okay? Inflation plus risk plus real interest rate equals 1.8%. Okay? And we want to find, the point we're saying this is we want to find the risk-free rate. So risk-free rate, take out the risk, 0.6%. Only inflation plus preference. Okay? Does everybody understand that point? So therefore we can find the risk-free rate for any country. Okay? We'll need the risk-free rate later for if I want to invest in Korea, I need to know the Korean risk-free rate. So every calculation of risk is going to include the risk-free rate. Because we don't start from zero. Okay? I don't say to your company, oh you did better than zero. That's great. Okay? Because we can make money without any risk. Okay? So we start from that point, not from the zero point. Okay? And that point is different for different countries because of inflation. Inflation is included in the risk-free rate, okay? So, other things we can do is we can just do our calculation in US dollars. For example, this company in Brazil, we can just do our analysis in US dollars instead of Brazilian real. Okay, you just change the real to dollars. But it's probably not as good as the first one because in that case, we have, it's a little bit more complicated. We could also just do our analysis in real terms. Just to take inflation out of everything. But again, that's more complicated. Okay? So the best way is just use the first one. Just for the country, find the rating, and 
take the default spread away from the yield. So discuss these questions with your partner. How should we calculate the risk-free rate if we are expecting cash flows for five years in euros? How should we calculate the risk-free rate if we are expecting cash flows in Chinese RMB? So I'm going to pass around the attendance list and don't just check your own name. So five years is not important, right? Just how should we calculate the risk free rate? If we're getting our money in euros, what are we going to use to calculate the risk-free rate in euros, okay? And how are we going to calculate the risk-free rate in Chinese RMB? So can anybody tell me what what should we use to calculate the risk-free rate in euros? How can we find the risk-free rate in euros? Can anybody answer the question? Can I want to find the risk-free rate? I'm investing in euros. I'm building some business in Europe. Okay. So I want to find the risk-free rate. What's the risk-free rate in the euro currency? Do you want to, how do you say currency in Korean? Huh? How do you say currency in Korean? Tongwa. Right, so I want to calculate the risk free rate in the euro currency. So what should I do? Anybody? By looking at the yield of Germany. Yes, look at the yield on the German 10 year bond. Okay, they normally use a 10 year bond. Okay? Five years we could use a five year bond we want, okay? But most people are looking at 10 years, 10 year investments, okay? In finance, we usually look at 10 year horizon. So we look at the yield on the 10 year bond, okay? So we go to Bloomberg, is that difficult? Is that difficult to find the yields on the 10 year bond in Germany, or not difficult? Not difficult. Not difficult, it takes about two seconds, okay? We type. 10 year yield Germany into Google and we see the information. Okay? Changes every day as people buy and sell the government bond of Germany. Okay? What about China? Is China the same as Germany? No. Or a little bit different? Different. Why? Different currencies. Right, so China is not an AAA rated country, so we have to add it we have to think about the default risk. So if we want a risk-free rate for China, let's just say that the yield, yield on China is 8%. Okay? We find out that China is rated A plus. Okay, let's say that's given is 2%. Right, this is 2% default risk we find from the table. Somebody asked me where do I get this number? Right, we can find that information on the internet. Okay? For the moment, just for quick, I'm just making that up, up at the top of my head. Okay? So A plus rating from the rating agency equals to 2% default risk. Okay? So the question is, how much is the risk-free rate for China? 6%. Okay? So what did we do? How did we find the default risk for China? First we we found the yield. Secondly, looked at the rating. OK, 
Okay, then we, after we found the rating, we find the difference. Found the table. You found the table to convert. This table, these values change as well over time, okay? Depending on whether investors are more risk on or risk off. If investors are more risk on, it means that they want to take risk, then there's going to be less difference. If investors are more risk off, they don't want to take risk, this number will be higher for an A plus rating, okay? But currently, we, we find the table and then we subtract, okay? And we find our uh, risk-free rate for Chinese R&D. <coughs> so, do you have any questions about the risk-free rate before we move on? I have a question. Yes? Um, the question is about the, um, the euro. Euro, yes. First of all, why do we find the data from Germany? Why do we use the data from Germany? Because Germany is the safest country in Europe. We're looking for a risk-free rate, and Germany is, is seen as the safest country. But if you wanted, you could use any AAA-rated country in Europe. Austria, Finland, we saw the Netherlands. Any of those are okay. It's not going to be that different from Germany. But generally in finance, people like to be conservative. Germany is the lowest one, so it's better to be conservative. So we choose Germany, the safest one. Okay? So good question. Okay, so then let's move on to talking about uh, the default risk more and the cost of debt. So we already explained about debt, just to review, debt means that we are making fixed payments in the future, the fixed payments are tax deductible, if we don't pay the money we have a default or lose control of the firm. That is debt, okay? Like a bank loan, obvious example of debt, or a bond, okay? Lease, leases are also included in debt. So, we have to estimate the cost of debt for the company. So it means that cost of debt means how much does it cost the company to get a loan? Okay, so how much does it cost? What's the interest rate? Okay, what's the yield? What's the interest rate? So, that's what we're calculating. Okay, if you work in a bank, you may have to calculate, you have to give a loan to the company. Okay, you may have to calculate what interest rate are we going to give to the company. 2%, 3%, 10%, okay? You're an investor who's buying the bond in the company. You want to know how much interest should I be getting on this money that I'm lending to the company, okay? Every company is going to be different. So we just look at countries, right? Korea's cost of debt is 1.8%. Korea has to pay 1.8% to investors to lend money, okay? So, just like anything, we're going to have inflation, okay, the real interest rate, and what we're worried about with cost of debt is default risk, okay? We know for the current, we know the risk-free rate, so basically our cost of debt is going to be equals to the risk-free rate plus default risk, okay? So every company is going to have different default risk, okay? We already understood default risk. So that's our time value of money. Risk-free rate is inflation plus real interest rate. That's our risk-free rate, okay? And then risk, so inflation, real interest rate, risk, is going to be equal to the cost of debt. And we can also call this, we can use this as the discount rate, or interest rate, other names, okay? Like you're using in the, your calculations, that's your interest rate, or discount rate, okay? That's how much we need to get paid to 
compensators for inflation, for preference, and for risk. So, we already talked about calculating this, so we don't need to talk about this anymore, okay? So now we're going to talk about this, okay? We need to calculate the default risk for different companies. So the easiest way to do this is just like we did for the country. Look at the yield on the bond, okay? So if, a, if the firm has bonds and the bonds are traded, then the yield, the yield is the interest rate. Just like for Korea, the yield is the interest rate. Okay? Do you think a big company like Coca-Cola sells bonds? No. Big company like Coca-Cola sells bonds? Yes or no? To investors. Does Coca-Cola sell bonds? Hands up. Who thinks Coca-Cola sells bonds? Yes. Hands up. Who thinks Coca-Cola doesn't sell bonds? Okay, you have to put up your hand. Yes or no? Does Coca-Cola sell bonds to investors? Does Coca-Cola only get loans from the bank? Or it also gets loans from investors called bonds? So let's have a hands and see. Who thinks yes? Coca-Cola gets loans directly from investors. Who thinks no? Coca-Cola only gets loans from the bank. Okay? I hope nobody put their hand up, just one person maybe for no. Of course Coca-Cola doesn't only get loans from the bank, okay? Coca-Cola is a massive global company. It's not going to just use the bank for getting loans, okay? Coca-Cola, if Coca-Cola gets loan from the bank, then it has to pay a higher interest rate. It can get a lower interest rate by selling bonds to investors, okay? So maybe I should explain a little bit how the bond market works. I owe you. So, the centre of the bond market is in London. Global bond market centre is in London. Okay? Coca Cola, they want to sell bonds. Okay? To investors. Coca Cola calls the investment bank. Investment bank, like for example Goldman Sachs, they say, Okay, Coca-Cola, we'll help you. Investment bank organizes an auction in London. Do you understand the auction? Young way, okay? At the auction, they sell the bonds. Who goes to the who goes to the auction to buy the bonds? What kind? Do you are you going to go there? No. Investor. So we have fund managers. The Korean pension fund manager, okay? There are a lot of funds in London. He calls up some of his contact in London. Can you go to the auction, okay? Can you buy some bonds in Coca-Cola for the Korean government pension fund, okay? Korean government pension fund buys bonds in Coca-Cola, okay? The Korean government pension fund doesn't want to just leave its money in the ground, okay? I pay my pension payment at the end of the month. Does the government dig a hole in the ground, get my money, put in the ground, cover up, wait for 20 years? Oh, you want your pension now? Okay. Where did I push? Where did I? Oh, I forgot. No pension, sorry. Right? So, Korean government is going to invest in things like bonds because bonds is quite safe, right? They're also going to invest in stocks. A little bit, maybe 10% or 20%, because they want to make more money for the pensions, okay? So they go there and they buy the bonds. Coca-Cola is happy, Korean government is happy, okay? If Coca-Cola just lent money from the bank, normal bank, in America, they're going to give them a higher interest rate, because <coughs> Korean government pension fund is diversified. They can afford to get a lower interest rate. Normal bank in the US may be not diversified. Okay? They're going to say to Coca-Cola, 5%, 6%. Investors will accept 3% or 4%. Okay? So that's how the bond market works. Do you have any question about the bond market? Bond market is not like the stock market. The stock market is, it can be done on computer. Millions of people trading. Bond market is, is for fund managers. Regular people don't buy bonds. Okay? It's done by mobile, by phone, phone networks. Okay? 
people are connected by computers, but it's big amounts of money. You can buy stocks for just two dollars. You can't buy bonds for just two dollars. Okay? Bonds is millions of dollars. So if the company sells their bond, then all we need to do, well actually there's another step, right? Here. That's the primary market. Secondary market is Korean government pension fund wants to sell their bond. There's a secondary market for the bonds, right? Trade the bonds. So we bought the bond at the auction. It doesn't have our name on it. It's just a bond. So we can sell the bond to somebody else. So there's a secondary market where we can trade the bonds. Okay? So the, the yield is changing all the time. Okay? Changes all the time. Because people who bought the bond at the auction, they're now buying and selling with other people. So the yield is changing, and we can use that yield to make the cost of debt for Coca-Cola. Okay? So in your second assignment, you're going to be calculating cost of debt and cost of equity for a company. So if you can find the yield on the bond of the company, then very easy. Finished. Cost of debt. Okay? Do you understand? It takes two seconds to find Germany's cost of debt. It might take you one minute to find Coca-Cola's cost of debt. Okay? You need to find the corporate bond yield and the yield on the Coca-Cola bond. Okay? You can also find the rating. So that's the easiest way. The second way is if the firm is rated, use the rating and the table, just like we did for the countries. Use the rating and the table to estimate the cost of debt. So this was the table we looked at. Okay? So if we, we can just type in here and see what happens. Credit rating, Coca-Cola. Okay, S&P credit rating, Coca-Cola. So AA. So it just took me two seconds. Okay? S&P has an AA credit rating for Coca-Cola. Okay? So we go back to our table here. This is for corporate, corporate is companies. So Coca-Cola is AA. Okay, we're looking at the 10 year, 1.2%. Okay, they give these numbers as 121 because it's small, right? So 1.2%. So we find our risk-free rate in dollars. So the risk-free rate in dollars for Coca-Cola the US was 1.7%, okay? So cost of debt equals risk-free rate plus default spread. Okay, default spread for Coca-Cola, AA. Okay, can we turn AA into a number? Yes, we can. It's 1.2%, okay? Plus 1.2%. So what is the cost of debt for Coca-Cola? 2.9%, is that expensive? Or cheap? Would you lend money to Coca-Cola for 2.9%? Yes. Anyway, they have quite a high rating. Okay, not the highest one, but very close. Okay, then. Some firms are not rated. Only big firms are rated. So, for your Second assignment, Try to you're going to choose public company, a large public company, right? Like Nike or Disney or Coca-Cola or Apple. Google or Yahoo, okay? So they're going to have a rating. So you'll be able to use this way. If you can't find the yield on their bond, you can use their rating, okay? Google, credit rating and the company. Or you can check the website of S&P or Moody's or so on, okay? Then for private companies, if you're working in the bank, and you have to decide to give a loan to a small company, that company might not have a rating. Okay? It's not a big company. So we have to make our own rating, called a synthetic rating. Do you know In Jung Jandi? Huh? In Jo Jandi? Do you like playing soccer on In Jo Jandi? In Jo Jandi is synthetic grass. Is it real grass? No. So it's the same for the rating. We made a synthetic rating, just our own rating. Okay? 
How do you say rating in Korean? <coughs> what, what was the word? Shinyeon what? We saw on the website. Shinyeon Balgo. Shinyeon Dunggo. So, Injo Dunggo. Is that correct? Hmm? No? I'm trying to make up Korean words. Hmm? How do you say it then? Synthetic rating in Korean. You get the idea anyway, right? It's not a real rating. It's not real grass on the soccer pitch, okay? So, how do we make the synthetic rating? Okay? That's the point. So, the rating for a firm can be estimated using the financial characteristics of the firm. In the simplest form, we just use the interest coverage ratio. So the interest coverage ratio is the EBIT over the interest expense. So we looked at EBIT in the, when we looked at the financial statements. Okay? EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. Okay? So in the income statement, we have revenue, right? Income statement. What, what else did we have in the income statement? What's below revenues? What goes under revenues? Minus, Minus what? Expenses. Expenses or costs. Okay. What does that give us? Net, net, income. net, net income. also called? EBIT. Okay. Earnings before interest and tax. Net income. Okay. Then after net income we have? Minus interest. Okay. Then after minus interest, minus tax. Okay. So sorry, this is gross income, right? And at the end we have our net income. Okay. So this one can be called EBIT, revenues minus costs. So we have interest here. So this is our simple income statement. So we simply take the EBIT and we divide it by the interest payments. Okay. That gives us an idea. This is basically profit before interest. Earnings is also profit, right? Profit before interest and taxes. Then our interest. Okay? How high is our interest? Okay? Are we do we, are we paying a lot of interest and making a low profit? Or are we paying very little interest and making a high profit? Which company do you want to be? Low interest and high profit, right? So which company is going to get a better rating? The company that's paying low interest and high profit. Why? Why will they get a better rating? Yes, they're going to be able to repay the interest and the loan, right? They have enough money to pay back the interest. So what this is what this equation is doing. Do we have enough money to pay back the interest? Okay? We're making a ratio. Do you understand ratio? So, we just put one over the other. So, if we look at some examples of companies here, we can see Disney, operating income, 6 billion. Interest expense, 800 million. Interest coverage ratio, 8.3. Okay, that's a high number, that's good. Big profit compared to interest. Okay, another company here, Let's say a chemical company, it has 5.5, so its interest payments are higher compared to its uh, profits. So this one is going to have a lower rating. So what we do then is we take this ratio, we find the ratio for the company, and we put the ratio into the table. We have a ratio for small companies, which we're probably going to be using because large companies will have rating already, okay, by the rating agency. What we're doing is we're making our own rating, because the rating agency didn't make a rating. <coughs> Why do rating agencies make a rating? They only make a rating when companies want to sell bonds to the public. So if companies are not selling bonds to the public, probably they don't, they didn't ask the rating agency to give them a rating, okay? Big companies ask the rating agency, come here, we'll pay you money, give us a rating. 
they give them a rating, then they can sell their bonds. If I'm Coca-Cola and I just want to sell my bonds without any rating, nobody's going to buy them. Because nobody wants to do the work of finding out exactly what's the problem with my company and looking at all the financial information. So they wait for the rating agencies to do that. Okay? The rating agency does all that work, looking at all the financial figures. This is very simple, but the rating agency will look at much more financial information. Okay? They'll also look at the news and other factors, and they will make their rating. Okay? So, small company here, this side. So we saw, let's say the rating was, for Disney was A something, right? So it's going to be A plus, A plus rating. So we use the table. We find the ratio, and then we come to the table, and we find the rating, and then we give a default spread. So if you're working in the bank, you can use that kind of way, okay? For the cost of debt for the company. You find the company's interest expenses and EBIT. Find the interest coverage ratio. Find this kind of a table, right? Convert the interest coverage ratio to the default and add that onto the risk-free rate. And then that's the interest rate. Maybe you can add on another percent just to be safe. Sometimes people do that kind of way, right? You can decide the interest rate. So Disney, AA, the chemical company, A minus. Not as good. So just one point on this, these uh, numbers. Do you think that we should just use last year's profit and last year's interest exp expenses, or the last 10 years or five years average? Which is better? Average of the last five years profit and average of the last five years interest expense, or just last year's? Average, average, average right? We should not, if we just use last year's, there could have been something funny last year that we just had a really bad year. Right? So it looks like we're really bad re ratio, but we're not really bad ratio. We need to look at the last five years, or ten years even better. Look at the average. It depends. If the company hasn't changed, we can look at the last ten years, right? But if the company has changed their business, then we only look at the last five years, because they've changed their business a little bit. Right? So... Uh, then, we also have to think about tax, right? So we, got, we found out for Disney, let's say, this was their rating, right? This was the risk-free rate. We did here for Coca-Cola. Let's say this was the risk-free rate at that time, 3.5%. Plus the default spread equals cost of debt. We did that for Coca-Cola, okay? Do we get some tax benefit from debt? Yes, we talked about it before, the tax benefit from debt. So we find our tax rate, and then we calculate the after tax cost of debt. Okay? So one minus the tax rate multiplied by this is after tax cost of debt. So then we know our cost of debt for the company. So what did we say the cost of debt was for Coca-Cola? 2.9%. So let's say the US tax rate is 30%, or Coca-Cola pays 30% tax. So who can tell me, what is the after-tax cost of debt for Coca-Cola? We can call this pre-tax cost of debt. Okay, then we have tax. So what is the after-tax cost of debt? 2%. Hmm? Can anybody do the calculation and tell me? Five point zero three. Five point zero three. It's going to be more than the pre-tax cost of debt. We get a tax benefit from debt, right? So because of the tax benefit, we can have cheaper. It's in effect, it's a cheaper rate. Okay? Do you understand? So we talked about before calculating the tax benefit of debt. So we need to multiply it by one minus the tax rate. Okay, so after tax cost of debt is the pre tax. 2.03. Pre tax cost multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. So it's going to be 2.9 multiplied by 0.7. Okay, that is? 
2.03. This is the after tax cost of debt for Coca Cola. Okay? So that's, that's like the real situation. That's how, because because Coca Cola get a tax advantage from debt, this is the real cost of debt. Okay? We need to take into account tax. So. <coughs> We looked at this company, Tata Chemicals. So we have the risk-free rate for India, plus the company risk, okay? But when we're doing in India, we have to add back in again the country default spread, okay? So uh, the, pre the cost of debt for this company is the Indian risk-free rate, which was 4%, okay? Plus, Add back in the country default risk, because it's an Indian company. 3% plus the company default spread we calculated from the synthetic rating, 3% equals 10%. And then we find the Indian tax rate. After tax cost of debt is pre-tax cost of debt times 1 minus the tax rate equals 6.6%. Okay? So we can notice that uh, the country default spread, we add back in again. Okay? Because the country has economic and political risk. So, when we lend money to the Indian company, we don't just think about the Indian company's individual risk, we also think about country risk. Okay? So, uh, the default spreads can get wider. Right? We looked at this table here, which was uh, this table is the corporate bond spreads. So this is, it says here, spread value is basis points over a US treasury security. So this means compared to the US bond. Okay? If, if your company is AAA, it's company AAA, not country AAA. So company AAA is more risky than country AAA. Okay? Rating agency has different one for country and different one for company. So we have to add on 10 years for a company, even the top rated company add on 0.76%. Okay? But this number can change over time. It's not always the same. Do you think that companies are always the same, more risky than countries or not? Sometimes companies are even more risky. In what situation would companies be even more risky? Hmm? When would this default spread get bigger? In what situation? The difference between investing in the US and investing in the company. Even though they have both have AAA rating. Uh, a good company can be, for example, in uh, Argentina, Argentina. Yes. And Argentina can save a default. Right? So we can have some risk in the world, in, in the Argentinian economy or world economy. Very risky situation. In the very risky situation in the world, economy, companies is going to be more risky than governments. So it's going to increase. So we can see this here, okay, on this uh, slide. So. Uh, we, we are comparing the different times. The blue line is January 2008, red line is September 2008, November 2008, yellow, and green, January 2009. So that's just from one year, January 2008 to 2009. So we can see that this is AAA. AAA spread increased from, you know, less than 1% to 2%. Why? Because 2009 we had the financial crisis, so the spread was getting bigger. Okay, for the lower rated companies, there's going to be even more change, right? You're a very risky company here. Normally, you have to pay an extra three percent over a U.S. government bond, but in the crisis, you're going to have to pay ten percent over a U.S. government bond. Okay, does that make sense? If there's an economic crisis, do you want to lend money? to a risky company? No, so you're not going to ask them for 3% more than a US government bond, you're going to ask them for 10% more, okay? 
So the cost of debt for companies can change according to the economy. Okay, we, have, we talk about risk on and risk off. If you watch the business news, they say investors are risk on. Means they like taking risk. Okay, or investors are risk off. Means they don't want to take any risk. The economy is in trouble, they don't want to take risk. Okay? So when investors are risk off, cost of debt gets higher for every, every company across the board. Do you have any question about that? <laughs> so, just uh, we can answer this question before the next class. Okay? <coughs> so, in the second assignment, you're going to be finding uh, using one company, and you'll be finding the cost of debt and cost of equity. Okay? So you can already think about it now, you could think about choosing a company. Okay? And here, just I want you to try and estimate an interest coverage ratio for your company. Okay? Using the synthetic rating. You can use the table from the PPT. And calculate the pre-tax cost of debt and the after-tax cost of debt. Okay? So although it's a big company and we can find the credit rating, okay, I want you just to practice making a synthetic rating. So go to the Yahoo Finance, you know Yahoo Finance? Go to Yahoo Finance, we looked at before. Yahoo Finance, choose a company. Or you can just Google income statement Coca-Cola, okay? So if I go to Yahoo Finance and I start typing in here Microsoft, here recent, Microsoft, okay? It comes up. And then on the left, this is Microsoft, on the left, financial income statement. Okay? Are you following? Yahoo Finance, type in the name of the company, it will come up, go to the left, income statement. Look at the income statement. It, operating income, Evid is operating income. Okay? Then look at the interest expense. Okay? And divide, make a synthetic rating for the company. Okay, then look at the PPT, calculate cost of debt, right? And after tax cost of debt. You can use 30% for the tax rate. Okay, do you have any question? No, okay, then let's finish there for today. Until Wednesday, yes. How long do you think that will take you? It shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes to do that. It should take you 10 minutes. Find the, in the operating income, find the interest expense on your finance, divide them, find the ratio, add that to the risk-free rate for the US. Right? Then do the tax. Finished. 10 minutes. Okay? Yes, so this is a heavy rate.